Hey guys, thanks for coming to hang out here on the sessions. A friendly reminder that you can hang out with me in more than one place because I'm also on AMP. Just download the app, come hang out with us Tuesdays and Thursdays, 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. Let's get a little more sessions in your life. We all need it. Okay, guys, another John session here. I just want to put it out there that we actually planned on recording this last week. And honestly, I kind of wish that we had have just recorded this last week before some drama Rama started to unfold, because now I feel like the spotlight is on you to respond to all of this drama. And I know that you don't really give a shit to respond to any of this drama, but of course I would be remiss to not ask you about it. <laughs> I guess. Is there anything that you would like to say or acknowledge or is there anything that you would like to address with all the stuff that has kind of unfolded in the last couple of days on the internet, in the wrestling world? No. Okay. Because nothing has unfolded. It's fucking annoying that, like, just because somebody said some stupid shit on social media, like, that's not news. But it is, and it ends up being a thing. Like, it's fucking annoying that we're sitting here like, we're, I wish we'd have fucking recorded this the other day. I know. When nothing had happened. Baby's we... crying and couldn't get her to stop crying, so. But now I'm like. Hey, we're just two know. parents trying to get yeah. it done. And you're like, I don't know. She bring it up, and I'm like, I don't know. I don't really want to talk about it. And the lawyers are like, oh, my God, are you going to talk about it? I'm like, I don't fucking know. I don't care. Like, but now I, I don't want to get dragged into this dumb shit. Yeah. But, you know. It is, but, okay, so I'm not going to say I could fucking unload on a lot of fucking people right now. And when I start getting dragged into this shit, it tempts me to do that. But I'm not going to fucking sink to that level because it's fucking lame. Well, it's but, a- but I'll tell you, I, Go I, ahead. I will say this. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what anybody else said or did or anything so that it's now I'm not going to say anything controversial. I'm just going to give you like a tidbit of information from my point of view uh, from the time period being discussed on whatever the fuck Graham. (laughs) Okay. The entire summer I was not under contract. Right. No contract. Free agent. I was at SummerSlam weekend wrestling fucking Desperado and shit. The day of SummerSlam. Fucking suplexed him on a bunch of aluminum cans and shit. Cut in half. It was fucking dope. I could have walked into SummerSlam that night. With the AEW fucking belt. If I had been so inclined. Nobody knew that because I don't put my shit out there in the world. And let everybody know every fucking thing about my business. You know? So... I was not under contract. Uh, reason being, if you're curious, because I got a rehab and my contract was coming up, they extended it for the time that I missed. Cool. Totally. I'm glad they did, actually, because I didn't want to feel like I owed them anything, you know? So <clears throat> they extended it a little bit. It was coming up. They're talking to me about it. And the last thing I wanted to do when I first got out of rehab, because all they were telling me is like, basically, logic would tell you don't go back to wrestling because you're just going to fall into the same old habits, right? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to just like ease back into it and see what life was like on the other side. And the last thing I wanted to do was just hurry up and sign a big long-term commitment. You know, and when they're, because what if, I don't know, what if shit started going off the rails? And, like, I don't know. Like, feel. yeah. And what I told him was like, look, you know, once it got to pretty quickly, I was like, man, actually being sober is awesome. This is fantastic. I'm having so much fun. Mm-hmm. I was enjoying, I was looking forward to coming to TVs. I was working with my friends, Blackpool Combat Club, me and Brian and shit. I was like, fucking Regal. Like, this is great. You know, and they're talking to me about signing a new thing. And I was like, if everything just stays exactly as it is right now, I'll be here forever. You can pay me in cash in an envelope at the end of the night. I don't give a fuck. But I can't tell you what I'm going to feel like in six months. Right. Especially not in three years or five years. And once I make a commitment, 
then I will push through injuries and I will push myself too hard and I will do all these things that, you know, uh, things like that add up and it leads you down the road or whatever. You know what I mean? So sure. I just kind of was just not, I was not in a hurry to make any kind of grand commitments, you know, at first. Mm -hmm. So that being said, during this time period, uh, the night in uh, Cleveland? fucking what's his dicks talking about it was in Indianapolis, not Indianapolis, Minneapolis. It was the night he came back and uh, was hopping around on one foot and all that and taking, bumping around inner circle or whatever after me and Jericho wrestled mm -hmm. in a badass match, by the way. Uh, so we're, we're talking later about stuff. Now, keep in mind at this time, this is my whole point. I basically don't work there for all intents and purposes. I don't even work here. Tony is not my boss. I can, I don't even have to be in this room. I don't have to do shit. So even me being in this room, uh, and offering and agreeing to a storyline that puts you over at the pay-per-view. If anything, I'm bending over backwards for Tony and for this dude and for the company and everybody. Because I didn't have to. I didn't have to do shit. Right. If anything, I was being... I was bending over backwards. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Okay. So here's, <laughs> here, I've got a couple of like, uh, you know, it's not even controversial. I'm just telling you. No, those are just facts. Those you are know, cut and dry keep facts. Fucking mind, okay. Know. So my questions to you then, just like based off of that, and this doesn't even have anything to do with that situation. That can be the only piece that you say in the situation. I, it, what's up to you? I don't care. Um, but this has been sort of a situation for you in terms of like any time there's been a little bit of a, oh, oh, something's happening. Oh, we got to do something. A lot of things have fallen on your shoulders. And I think I think it's pretty fair to say you as one of the, the cornerstones of AEW, your run as champion. And I mean, even if you want to go back to the, the pandemic days, but I think specifically you being able to step in if somebody's injured, if someone's in a situation that you have been that guy, what kind of pressure comes with being that guy in situations when you haven't necessarily it's not been planned out, but you step up in those uh, occasions. I mean, that's what a big part of my career has been. Yeah. You got to be ready to seize opportunities when they arise. Mm -hmm. um, I think the last time we did this was right before Forbidden Door. When I got slotted into Russell Tanahashi, which turned out amazing. Right. You know, so that yeah. was just an opportunity. Got to be ready for that stuff. So. For young wrestlers listening, you know, you gotta, you never know what's around the corner. So, you know, be ready at all times, you know? It really is crazy to think of like your career and you with things you, like that happening. It's yeah. not just now. It's And like, I've never, I don't, I've never been like, uh, it's never been like the plan to build everything around me. Right. You know, the only time when it was kind of like that, uh, the pandemic happened and the whole world shut down. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. You know, that's the only, the only time that ever happened. Right? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, that's, does it get like annoying sometimes to be like, you know, if you'd have just fucking gone with me in the first place, like we wouldn't be fucking going through this again. Right. It kind of does, but also like, no, nah, it's all good. Like, I don't complain. I see the good and everything and i'm just so having so much fucking fun mm -hmm. and like life is so fucking good right now that i don't want any negative bullshit right like how what's the fucking complain about you know like ugh. well like and i guess you can kind of like unload on that a little bit of just I mean, like no, the no, frustrations just, of not even this situation I mean, I will, but i will say this you know and uh i hate to say i don't think i've ever said anything uh, even remotely negative about AEW, but I will say this as an observer, it 
seems like, you know, I spent eight years on the Indies, spent a couple years in WWE developmental, spent like eight years in WWE. I have never seen so much bullshit drama in one place in my entire fucking life. And I hate to say that, but it's like, and I don't know if it's because of the age of social media, she gets like blown out of proportion. Right. Like one person types one stupid fucking drunk tweet and all of a sudden it's all anybody wants to talk about. Mm-hmm. You know, like. But also it's like maybe just like a generational thing as well. Like not only the social media aspect, but like people are coming into the business a different way. Um, people seem to be able to behave a certain, people just can go into business for themselves, whether they're going on social media and talking about how they're not being booked or, you know, how they're undervalued or whatever, whatever. But it is really crazy. I mean, I think when you really, you don't even have to step back to look at it, but like with what has been built with AEW and how special AEW is and the core group of all the people that make up AEW, it's this like wrestling oasis Yet there's still people that are chipping away that want to like talk shit and sort of disrupt this thing that you guys have all been working really hard hard to build. Yeah, like we're sitting up here on a Friday doing a podcast. You know what we're not talking about? We're not talking about the fucking stellar match by Kingo and Kenny Omega. Woo! Oh my word. All the cool stuff going on in AW with cool show is happening we're not talking about this great pay-per-view we just had yeah great pay-per-view you know we're not talking about anything we're talking about some bullshit so yeah i'll say this so there's no there's no there's uh great talent at AEW, and uh there is a lot of people who work really fucking hard and the mm-hmm. major the vast majority of people like let me be clear the vast majority of people there don't cause any fucking trouble. Sure. Any bullshit. You sure. Know? And there's, they're just, but they're getting sucked down into this shit. Yeah. yeah. Like everybody else. Yeah. Into the muck. Yeah. You know, there's plenty of people who just want to get better and uh, perform and fucking just do this job, man. It's the best job in the world. Yeah. And th- there's a lot of that. And I've taken uh, a lot of people, like, I'm not an official coach. I definitely don't ever want to be a producer, so to speak. You know, I don't want to be so good at it, though. I mean, I know it's a pain in the ass. I don't want to be be really good at it. I don't want to be an official producer. You don't want to wear the headset. I don't want to wear the headset. I don't want to have to write stuff down and talk to the. But if we get you a wireless headset. uh, No, like I but. I like being a coach. Yeah. Right. But I'm not any kind of official capacity of a coach. But I coach people that I think are worth it. Who are some of those people? And have like a good uh, attitude about it and like really will put in the work to get better and will. Uh, people who are worth my time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, I'll give time to anybody, but like, you know, if I don't, if it, then I'll. Well, some know. people don't want to actually be coachable or you know people like the idea of yeah and i don't people i don't want to just like, if you're gonna put them over they'll want to sit and work with you but if you yeah know. and like i'm actually like pretty like uh i don't know like just my natural uh whatever you want to call it like anti-socialness don't want to <laughs> talk to anybody they're not i don't want to like bother anybody or come off like i'm trying to like Listen up, you kid. I'll tell it. you how to do it. No. Sure, sure. Sometimes I'm like, I watch something and I see something. And I'm like, man, I really want to tell this guy this or this girl this. And I'm like, I, and I just don't say it to him, even though it could have been something that helped. And then I usually like regret it. But if they come, I'm usually like, I hope they come up to me and ask. Because mm. then I won't feel like it. But now I've stopped. Now I've, now I'll just come up to somebody and be like, just saying. And I'll usually, and I'll tell people this too, like, I don't even like the word advice, right? Because advice sounds like something you have to take. I'm just throwing ideas. The little suggestion box. Yeah, I'm just riffing some, uh, you know, ideas and we're just talking, you know? Like, if you don't like my idea or if I go, hey, you should do a backflip and kick somebody in the face. If you're like, "I I think that's stupid, then don't do it. You know, I'm not offended. Maybe it's a bad idea. I don't know. Or like, I'm just you, you want know. to collaborate collaboration yes but I'll 
you know, but I also kind of, you know, I love getting the best out of people. And I love when I see things in people that's like dying to get out and bringing that out. Like, uh, yeah. Who are some of those people? Give us like some examples. Oh, like Marina Shafir, for example. Mm -hmm. So much potential there. Yeah. So much untapped potential. She's the only one of her species we have at, at AEW. There is, there's nobody else. We only have one of her. Mm hmm. Uh, she should it might like I see her wrestling different than everybody looking talking acting different than everybody because she has all these you know martial arts skills and judo high level judo and stuff and mm -hmm. MMA experience and she's such a natural at so much of it you know that uh, she's new at the pro wrestling stuff like the running and ducking and selling and bumping and you know, all that but uh, I seen her wrestle at Bloodsport, which we got a Bloodsport coming up on uh, March 3rd. Ooh, who are you going to wrestle? Big question mark. Uh, Alex Coughlin. Oh, was it announced? Or are you announcing it right now? Uh, one way or another. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, and I was cool with, uh, with whatever. I was like. You should have fought Marina. That would have been yeah. cool. You don't want none of this, man. <laughs> whoop my ass. But I seen her wrestle at Bloodsport, and it was like she was a different wrestler. That yeah. I've seen working on dark and elevation and stuff like that. It was like she was totally different because she was in her element. Right. She's comfortable. Uh, she wrestled Masa Slamovich, very talented girl. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's wrestling barefoot and moving around, and like her footwork and, you know, her kicks and movement and everything was like like totally different because she was in her element and i'm like we need to bring that to tv yeah know? and that that just brings a whole new uh kind of element to the division you know so you know just like a suggestion i was like you know in blood sport you because you used to wear boots and i was like in blood sport you're wrestling barefoot and i'm not saying you just wrestle barefoot if you don't want to wrestle barefoot then don't i don't i don't give a shit it's all good it's whatever you want but I'm just saying, the fact that you were barefoot drew my eyes to your feet, and it made me notice how good your footwork was. Oh, okay. I like and that. It, it made you look like way more athletic, mm. and it like added a whole new dimension. You know, it wasn't just like uh, somebody's the difference in somebody's wearing blue boots or red boots. Sure, no, it was sure. like it like, added yeah it, it just created this whole other uh dynamic to her you know it's just like, hey, a she, different athlete. Yeah, like lately she's been trying that out you know and like there was one of the matches she had i'm just trying to get her to like just loosen up and just uh and she has and she like works really hard to work on these little things and she goes out there to get better every single time and uh no I'm just trying to get her to just be loose and just do what she knows how to do. But I was like, you already know how to do everything you need to know. It's just putting it where it needs to go and all these little mm -hmm. things, you know, and that just takes experience. Right. You know? So one of the matches she had, I think it was with Athena where uh, they actually had a good amount of time. It wasn't just like four or five minutes. Yeah. Know? And uh, once they hit the, you know, halfway through the match marker and they were in a good sweat and were warmed up and started going, you saw her change gears. And seeing that, that's what I've been waiting to see. And it's like so subtle and like I can notice it, but when she got into the zone and changed those gears, I was like, oh, it pumped me up. It was like, <laughs> like it, gave me a, it gave me a high like I was in the ring. You know? yeah, yeah. So that's another good thing about coaching is I realized like, Oh, I could get like I could get hurt and break my neck tomorrow. Well, don't but do I can that, still please, for the love of God. Yeah, even after that, and or meaning I could not be able to wrestle tomorrow. Yeah, but I could still kind of get that same satisfaction and that same high. Yeah, by helping other people and bringing that out of them. Like she had a match with Revolver, and I was there for with Billy Starks, and it was awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, it gave me like the high, like I was in the ring. Mm -hmm. Oh my god. <laughs> oh man, I'm like 
Yeah, sure. I've been doing a lot of that. <laughs> That's so. the best. Is there anyone With else guys, in particular you know, like, that you've been, I know you've been working with Marina quite a bit. Is there anybody else? Uh, coming in. Uh -huh. I, I sent him to Defy and put him in the ring with Rocky Romero. Mm. And that gave him like a whole new confidence level. Why is Rocky the guy that you want to set somebody up in the ring with? Because he's the guy that has all the experience in the world and is so good. And people forget because he's, you know, office sure. rock. People forget how good he is. And, you know, he's a guy that you can just send somebody in there and go, listen to Rocky for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. so just go out there and do what he tells you to do, you know? And uh, it's hard because we don't have, you know, we're not on the road Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Yeah, you don't get that other house. So somebody, some of these younger guys, you know, they have a match and it's like, oh, okay, cool. We'll work on this, this, and this. We're not going to do it again tomorrow night. Whereas if they had more house shows and they were like working with top guys every single night, you can like I was lucky. Work out that kink, yeah. Like I had lots of experience before I came to WWE. Uh, realized I didn't know shit about wrestling on TV and all these cameras and that whole game. And it's a whole different thing. But I get to work with all the top guys. I was just very fortunate in my position. Yeah, we work with the top guys every single night. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. That'll for, fast track, for yeah. For two years. Yeah. You know, like, a lot of these young guys don't get that. So, we would be doing more. So, one of my ideas, we would be doing more house shows. We just started. We just Yeah, let's in. talk about that house show because it was a huge success. You guys drew, what, like 3,000 people yeah, were in Troy, house. Ohio. And the funny thing for me, and, like, I wasn't there. I stayed home with the baby. You went out and did your thing. But I was like following everything online and seeing everyone's tweets. Like, I feel like everybody that was booked on the show – had a fucking awesome time. Like, it seems like it, I think it actually kind of shocked people to go, oh, this was cool. Yeah, it was a big success for the people that were there and the fans and everything, you know, like, um, yeah, I don't think could have gone any better. We worked with uh, Cass and Lee Moriarty, you mm -hmm. know, another two guys with, you know, immense potential, you know, and just takes experience and finding those extra little things that make you, you, you know? Uh, yeah. So we'll do more of those, you know, and the whole point of that, you know, I think people are probably going to like compare, you know, it's not the same thing as like we're running in a big market with all our stars, like WWE, for instance. Right. The whole point of this is to just have a place where guys can get reps. Mm -hmm. Like the idea that I heard initially was like, you'd be kind of like uh, the FCW, NXT, Coconut. Like Coco, yeah. 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 Like in FCW, we wrestled in. Fort Myers and uh, Crystal Creek or all these little uh, Florida towns, you know, like mm -hmm. in, on the weekends. And, uh, you know, some guys like need that. Another idea that I have been trying to do is just working with other indie companies and uh, sending guys there like Defy. On, their, on their days off, you know, Defy, Revolver, these places. Yeah. And uh yeah, that's helped a lot too for guys, you know, just to give them more, uh, you know, wrestling on TV is totally different than not being on TV. Sure. That's why I do, like, I don't do any of these because they pay me a bunch of money or anything. I don't because I want that extra practice yeah. to stay sharp, to try things out. There's stuff I do on an indie show that I've done on, that I made up on the spot in an indie show that I did on TV and pay-per-view, mm -hmm. you know, where I was like, ah, you know, I like being out there. It's kind of like, just like a jam session. If you're a musician, right. Just pick up a guitar and start picking, see what happens. You know, uh, I need that. So, you know, it, that's been kind of successful. It's something I've been trying to implement, you know, and uh, with the house shows, if we start doing more of those, that'd be a good thing too. So, right. Um, okay. Um, you mentioned um, Kenny Omega and Vikingo. Um, they obviously had such an insane match. Um, I know you were obviously busy throughout the night. Did you get? Have you watched the full match yet? Uh, most of it, yeah. Yeah. So to see that match, and you know, I'll be the first to say I, I was not really familiar with what I was going to get from Vikingo, but to watch this match, see what these two did. And to see the reaction in this, like, 
swell of like affection for Vikingo. And obviously we know how great Kenny Omega is, but there was a lot of rumblings, I guess, of people being like, who's this guy? What is this happening? It, it, I think that's one of the really cool things about AEW, the way that matches like this can be put together and then you can sort of build a storyline afterwards should that be the case that they want to do something. But putting on a match like that and putting on a dream situation like that was really well received. Oh, I knew. I knew. You knew. As, as I saw that, I went, oh, he's going to blow people's fucking... Oh, my God. I I, I've seen him. So I knew exactly you know, what was going to happen. I do attack Kenny afterward, but that... Totally different thing. Nothing to do with. Right. You know, that's why I waited till. Why we waited till after the match. Respect. You know? Respect. It was a different situation. Right. Right. Let them do their thing and then yeah, get some, back to brass tacks. Some. Uh, some uh, gang warfare issues. Fair. Fair. Um, battle lines territory and so forth because you still work and do so many different indies and you get to work with so many other people who are some people that you would like to see brought more into the mix with AEW like a a bunch you know uh, I don't know how many I'll do this year you know uh, because I kind of was like I don't want to what I don't like is uh I have to be really uh, cognizant of not pushing myself too hard. Right. Oh, my because, God. Yeah. Because that's I'm just a very foot to the gas pedal person and I don't know any different. Right. Uh, so if I'm feeling like really great, I'll be like, OK, I'll book myself for six Saturdays in a row and uh, wrestle 20 minutes on dynamite every week. And you get halfway through that and you're like, oh, man. <laughs> pretty beat up. Maybe I should take a week off. But then it's too late because if I do an indie show. Now it's you have to be there. Now all the tickets are sold and the whole thing's like built around me and they're streaming it and everything. And it's like I can't just call off. Yeah. And so I have to go. And uh and, and then, you know, and then, you know, I have this commitment to AEW. Like the thing with OTT the other week, you know, I was right fucking furious about just because I'm totally happy to do a house show. You're telling me you're gonna do a show and I only have to drive 90 miles to Troy, Ohio. Yep. Great. What what better way to spend a Saturday yeah, night? You gotta bring your dad and everything. But, yeah, but I didn't like getting I was already booked on the day. Yeah. So now I it's just this weight that you know, the days I missed, like when I was in rehab, I missed the Defy show and whatever else, and they eat a bunch of AW shows and pay-per-view and having that weight on my back of like a date I feel like I got to make up. I feel so bad about it. Yeah. I hate having that weight. So now I still have to go to OTT. Those poor guys. And When are you going? Can I make a trip out of it? I don't know. I probably shouldn't even advertise it because I don't want to jinx it at this point. No. I'm just going to show up one day. <laughs> but I will make that date up. So sorry about that unfortunate uh, circumstance, fans in Ireland. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I'm not answering a question, but I don't remember my question right even was. Go uh, for it. Hey, the mic is yours. The floor is yours. I've been doing a lot with uh, the wrestling revolver, mm-hmm. which is uh, my former partner. Well, I'd still have a team with him this year. Uh, Sammy Callahan. Yeah. It's his promotion. And Sammy is a hell of a little promoter, man. Yeah. And always has been. He used to run a little company called Lucha Core back in the day. And he's just, he's a hustler. And I mean that in the best sense. Like yeah. he works his ass off on all kinds of, you know, he's good with like graphics and media and stuff like that. He'd make a, he'll make a highlight video or a preview package or something in a day. Yeah. You know, and it looks great. Yeah. Uh, what a skill to have. I wish I had that skill so yeah. bad. He, we make a good uh, uh, partnership for Revolver because he loves to do all the stuff that I would never do. Right. I don't want to be a promoter. I don't want to look at logistics i couldn't imagine you editing a video i didn't like when you take my picture oh god i don't know how to do anything i can barely work my phone you know so (laughs) but i I don't want to you know handle money and booking and all this stuff you know but uh but i love wrestling and the coaching you know being there you know Mm -hmm. do do meet and greet all that kind of stuff you know cool uh so he handles one part and i handle another part you know so uh that's been a great uh yeah partnership yeah and uh we got a lot 
Got some stuff cooking. A lot more cooking for this year. I think they got a, dude, some shows in Iowa with a really great crowd out there. Okay. Like, uh, thousand people out there on the reg. And we just started kind of building the audience here in Dayton. Had a little building in Dayton, maybe moved to a bigger building eventually, but we're just building the audience here and got all kinds of. I mean, you kind of said that as soon as you got into Cincinnati, that you really want to make Cincinnati more of a wrestling I city. So do. the it wheels was, are in motion. It was like a hotbed, you know. Uh, yeah, with Brian Pillman Jr. or uh, early, Jr. Yeah. Brian Pillman Jr. is here too. Well, early 2000s, <laughs> you know, because uh, people come here, you know, back before, you know, there might not have been a reputable school on every corner. Right. There wasn't as many places to train and it was still a little bit more of a secretive kind of, you know, there was a little bit more barrier to entry and where the internet was like it is now, you know, people used to come here to Cincinnati from all over the country yeah. and all over yeah. the world. For instance, Nigel McGinnis traveled all the way here from England to Cincinnati to train. Yeah. So, uh, and this is where the, the original uh, film and memorial shows were. Right, and, right. Uh, you know, there's a lot of history here with like NWA and stuff. So uh, you can find a lot of old, cool posters from like Cincinnati Garden. Oh, like, I want to find know. some of those. Well, I got you that one, but it, I actually don't like the way that it came. I wish it was like a legit poster. It's like on a board. I wish I got like the like a more of an original version of it. It's cool. Yeah. But, you know, this is the very, uh, you know, I love Cincinnati, man. It's like, I can't imagine coming from anywhere else. It feels so it feels so good to be home. Anyway. Isn't it nice? Like it's not my home, but like I I get like sort of like the residual your home, that like comfort level. But it it feels like home to me because there's something very like Ontario about it. I don't know what that is. Yeah, well, same deciduous forest. Yes, it's the la- yeah, the landscape is but, nice. Yeah. Yeah, because it's a big city, but it's still a small town. Yeah. You know, and you got everything here, but, you know, it's still kind of uh, it's a little urban, a little country, you know, a little bit of everything. And I'm just a little bit of rock and roll. I just realized I my like, jumpsuit's on Inside Out. Wow. I'm very happy to be back in a city. Oh, my God. Isn't it city, so nice? I'm a city person. See? Like, Claudio lives out in the wilderness outside of Orlando. Yeah, taking you know, down wasps' nests and, and like shit. A compound. I mean, the great thing about it is he built that gym out there. Oh, right. So he's got like, he's out in the sticks, man. You're building a gym currently. I am. In the basement. If it ever gets done. Did you go down there today? Is there water down there? Yeah, there's no water. Oh, good. So Huge. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm building a physical location for the Blackpool Combat Club in my basement. Which is how I can out. join. Can I join the Blackpool Combat Club? That uh, he's know, ignoring me, discuss. everybody. <laughs> yeah, but it's gonna be, you know, basically, you know, kind of like a heart dungeon kind of scenario. Hell yeah! All right, well, it's a really old, I'll be, very dungeon. I'll be the basement. Helen Hart. So we had to pour a concrete floor and seal all the walls and waterproof it. And it's been a the house is coming together. Mess put it together, but once it's uh, once, once it's, it's done, it's gonna be awesome. Very yeah. simple, just. Mat space, heavy bags, weights, uh, simple. You know, we'll be able to train. We can train wrestlers here. We can train jujitsu here. We can train anything here. You know, you can come down and do your fucking Pilates or whatever. Oh, we can, can do anything. I, can I put a Pilates machine down there? A little reformer machine? No. Mm. But you can. Okay. You can use it when I'm not there. <laughs> okay. Just clean, up, clean up after yourself. Me clean up after myself. Do you even dare? I can't even imagine yeah. the cesspool that's going to be like there. I'm messy, but if you ever share a hotel room with this woman, okay, I call it the panty bomb. <laughs> Just, as soon as she's in the room, bras everywhere, makeup everywhere, yeah, you know all spin. kinds of lotions. And no, but your side of the all table, over the place, dude. His bedside. So I feel like our bed is so clearly divided in half that your side of the bed, first of all, your pillowcases in your bedding is all covered in fucking droplets of blood um, because your face is always bleeding. It's the price of glory. <laughs> and then there's like ice cream uh, bowls. There's like athletic uh, non-alcoholic like beer cans. There's dip bottles. Your side of the bed gives me anxiety. I can't even like today. I was like, oh, I went to go clean it. And I was like, no, I'm not cleaning this. I'm not doing it. It's a mess. You just got thrown under the bus. You have no rebuttal because it's true. No, I, you know, 
I like to eat ice cream in bed sometimes. I have no problem with that. Just take it down in the morning. You can eat whatever the fuck. I do. John, you're now you're lying. No, I'm not. I... <laughs> okay. Can maybe, we talk? Maybe can I get to it eventually. Eventually. Know. Well, that's the problem is the eventually because now we have a cat because now there's there's like mice that we get every now and then. And I think the if I see one mouse upstairs, shit's going to hit the fan. Let's talk about this cat first of all. Oh, where is he up here? I'm not a cat person. Cat's so good. Per se. Like, I don't know about cats. They, they're they shifty. I feel like you can't trust them. They shit in the house. In their litter box, though. Like, just, I don't know. They're not, just not a cat person, you know? So she just buys this cat without asking me. That's not true. That is 100% true. I ran it by you. And I said, I don't want a cat. And then you went and bought it. Now he's here. So. And it's a, it's a main coon. Which is like supposed to be one of the best mouser cats. And it has six toes. Yeah. It's a six toed cat. It's called a polydactyl. Big ass paw. It looks like a catcher's mitt. Giant paws. Mickey Mouse hands. <laughs> it's crazy. And they're going to get, he's going to get huge. They get up to like 25, 30. Yeah. Pounds. He's already getting, he's like, when he hits the ground, you hear him. He hits with a thud. Yeah. He's like, he's like basically a little feral bobcat that lives in our house. Yeah. Like, but she got this cat uh, because she's afraid of mice. Because we had, I mean, it's a house. It's an old house. It's an old I house. We wants- back into the woods. And we are also like kind of in the city. So we run into a lot of circumstances. Yeah, every once in a while, you get a mouse. Nobody do. So we put like traps out and, you know, had a, we had the exterminator guy make sure that, the, you know, was this one or two mice here I and there. No big deal. Mice. Like it's my, and it's I'm unlocking the one who, a fear for me. I'm the one who goes and checks all the traps. And I've had to encounter a couple of dead mice and I deal with them and get rid of them. You didn't have to deal with the mice. But now, because she bought this giant six-toed <laughs> mouse killing machine <laughs> that's now your best friend. He is my best friend. I love this cat so much. She's going to kill mice and bring them to you. <laughs> And while you're in bed reading a book right before you go to sleep at night, he's going to come up and drop the dead <laughs> mouse, mouse guts hanging out, ears all ripped off, tail flapping around. He's going to drop it right on your on your lap. <laughs> okay. You're going to encounter many more mice now. I cannot fucking wait until he brings you a dead mouse. Okay. So I you- hope to God that I'm there for you. Oh. You bring up a, a strong, valid point, but I feel like you skirted around the part of the story where you were going to put over the cat. I gave him a six month probationary period. <laughs> I kind of like him. You like him because you were saying I'm not a cat person. I don't like cats. He's tra- la, la. Yeah, he just kind of hangs out. He's a good guy. Yeah. He's like super social. So I was not. That I, I mean, obviously, I got the cat. Yeah, I brought the very, cat into the family. He's very chill. But I always loved cats as a kid. I always had them. I've had many cats, but I've not had a cat for a really long time. So I was just kind of like, eh, sure, let's get a cat. It'll kill the mice. I didn't know that he was going to become my best friend the way that he has. Sweet guy. Like, he follows me room to room like a dog. He cuddles me in bed. Like, I wear him, like, as a scarf when I go to sleep. He's a sweet guy. I love him. Yeah, he just He hangs out. He's chill. He's very good. Good guy. Um, okay, uh, quickly to just wrap this up, just circle back to another wrestling thing. Are we wrapping it up? I mean, I think we're getting close. We've been talking for a while. You got more shit you want to say? I don't know. I'm just getting warmed up now. Oh, okay. Well, fuck. Keep it spinning. Keep the mic hot, baby. Um, bleeding so much during your matches. Let's talk about the Texas death match with you and uh, Hangman Adam Page. This was number four for you guys. I feel like the chemistry between the two of you is uh, incredible. You guys have had some really great matches. However, the Texas death match definitely made me feel a little bit sick to my stomach. The fork to the forehead of Hangman while you had him in that uh, reverse triangle. Uh, (laughs) Um, It was upsetting. I didn't like it. It made my stomach turn. Talk to me about blood in a match in your Infections for me, it makes me very happy that it was upsetting to you. Yeah, it was because yeah, I loved everything with the hangman stuff. You know, uh, 
I like to experiment with things. You know, I'm not sexually. That too. <laughs> I don't like I give zero fucks about convention or the way things are supposed to be done or formulas or whatever. I'm trying to explore new ways of doing things. People have like a certain idea in their head of like what a great match is. It starts out slow and it builds and then we have a bunch of both finishes or whatever. Like what? Why can't you do a great match in three minutes? What if you could? I don't know. Never been done before. That was the whole idea behind Anarchy in the Arena. They wanted to do a stadium stampede again. And I was like, I ain't doing that. That's how the conversation started anyway. It was like, I was like, yeah. I ain't doing that. Whatever. But, but okay, well, if I was going to do it, I would do it once in one take live in front of the whole crowd. And that was Anarchy in the Arena. Yeah. You know, so... That's how I look at things. You try to go, okay, well, has anybody ever done it like this? And like simple stuff, you know, I'm not Vikingo. I'm not like, has anybody ever done a triple backflip? No, he's like, not. He, he literally moves like a person with extra like limbs or something. It's yeah, why does wild. every match have to have the same formula and so forth? Like, uh, for instance, like uh, our match in uh, LA. You know, instead of. Your match in LA was right when he when he came back, right? Yeah, and I was like, what? You know, instead of like a typical formula that builds, I was like, I kind of, the kind of blueprint I used in my mind was the uh, first Cody Garbrandt, TJ Dillashaw fight. Okay. Very heated. And they start out, and it's very, it's very short. It's like a round and a half. They start out, they're throwing heat. Cody nails him at the end of the round, rocks him. Seems like if the round, the, the clock stopped, the round kind of seemed like it saved TJ. He kind of wobbled over to his corner. Round starts again. They go back at it. TJ wallops him with like a head kick. Now he's kind of rocked. And then 30 seconds later, rocks him again and it's over. So it went way hard to the left, way hard to the right. And that was it. There was no like up and down and this and that. Yeah. It was just like, Foot to the gas pedal. Here we go. We're throwing bombs. We're going 100% right from the get-go. Way hard to the right. Steering wheel way hard to the left. It's over. Mm -hmm. so that's what I wanted to do there. I was like, I'm going to whoop your ass. Like, get on him from the beginning. Put him in major peril. And then when it turns around, it just goes all the way through. And boom, buckshot. I'm fucking done. Like, it's just like over. You know? Uh, and that's what we did yeah and accomplished and yeah i was very uh i mean yeah i was very pleased with that and you know do just, you draw more inspiration from mma these days than uh than you kind of do from pro wrestling in terms of building your matches what i get from it more so than anything is uh storytelling because they do do a really great job yeah, and I'm not talking about like, oh, somebody broke into somebody's house and uh, ran their, through their belt in the river or <laughs> yeah, uh, whatever, you know, like storytelling is like striker versus grappler, veteran versus rookie. Yeah. Uh, simple stuff and see how those stories play out because like every fight has a story. Yeah. So-and-so got to the ground and dominated on the ground or... So and so was doing really good for four rounds, and then he, yeah, like Leon Edwards, you know, yeah, yeah, last minute hail mary head kick, it's over. Yeah, you know, that was the story. Like if you ask, like what happened in that? Well, that's the story. He was winning for four rounds, and then right at the last second head kick. Yeah, um, it's not specific to MMA, like, uh, or even just combat sports, like. Every football game, yeah, of course, has a story. Yeah, I'm not a football expert or anything, but hey, what happened to the Bengals game last night? Well, they got out to a really big lead, and then the other team chipped away at it, and then they lost in the fourth quarter. That was the story. Yeah, or it was a defensive struggle, very low scoring game, or it was a very high scoring game, forty nine to forty nine. It was just touchdowns everywhere, or it was someone. 
Zone it's such team. Story, yeah, it's always story, always yeah. the theme. Running game, control the clock. That that was the story. So, yeah, you know, every, every match has a story. The story can be whatever you want it to be. There are no rules. You know, people talk about psychology and storytelling and stuff. There, sometimes they don't even know what the fuck they're talking about. You know, the story can be anything. Mm-hmm. You know, wrestling can be anything. You know, there's no, it's, there's no rules. And that, you know? like during your time in WWE, oh, so the, for for example, definitely don't want to fucking talk about WWE. <laughs> no, I was just going to ask you about the storytelling and how people can fall into more like formulaic. Yeah, they have or a, so. Yeah, That's what like, I was going to say. WWE has a very okay, perfect example. Like they have people talk about style, right? When I'm talking about styles, I'm not talking about like moves because in 2023, everybody does modern moves influence from all over the world. Mm -hmm. Um, Every single WWE match, you know, will have like Lucha Libre moves and stuff, you know, like head scissors and all this, you know, everybody does like modern moves, you know, but, uh, when I think of style, I think more of like pacing and psychology and timing and so forth. Uh, Japanese style or like WWE has a very specific style of match, you know, no matter who, no matter who's in the ring. And uh, I like to just kind of not really have a big game plan sometimes and just yeah. like see what happens and i'm like my does that dirt. make your opponents stressed out yeah a lot a lot of times sometimes <laughs> um, so i like to my character kind of and my real personality and the way i like to wrestle and the way i do things and just like me as a person like i said earlier very foot to the gas pedal so for me I'm not trying to waste a bunch of time. You know, I'm like, bell rings, let's fucking go. And went to the gas pedal until somebody runs off the road. Yeah. You know, I'm not trying to like stretch stuff out really, really long. Mm -hmm. It's just like, it doesn't feel right to me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. uh, That's, you know, that's kind of like, I've been kind of developing my own new style like i'm not saying i invented a style but i've just kind of been coming up with my proprietary blend okay and uh texas deathmatch is a perfect example you know we didn't go out there to uh we didn't adhere to like a formula in those like last man standing matches typically you can have like big long they can be kind of slow paced Mm because they do big stunt bumps and then everybody just lays there for nine seconds like what we got going with these last man standing matches, not last man standing, what we have going in AEW with these Texas death matches is a really cool thing, I think, because they're really fast paced. Yeah. From uh, It started with me and Lance in Japan because right before I went out to challenge him, it was this going to be like a no DQ match? Right. And I asked him and Gato just because Lance is from Texas. So it's like, let's just give it a different name, something cool. I was like, what if I say Texas death match. Gato goes, oh, I like. So I go out <laughs> and I just said Texas death match. And we didn't even know what the rules were going to be. <laughs> so yeah. like, I was then after that, then I went and looked up like the old school Texas death match rules. And it's like you get a fall and then the 10 count starts, which could be very drawn. Yeah. Out. So. Well, me and Lance decided I was basically just knockout or submission and standing 10 count. Right. So it was kind of like, which was pretty unique for Japan because they don't do those. And the crowd really got with it like nine, eight, or seven, eight, you know? Yeah. Uh, so that was me and Lance did that in Japan. And then Tony had the idea to have a big night for Lance in Texas, Texas Death Match 2 with me and Lance. Mm-hmm. Another badass match. Same thing, really, really fast paced. Not like drawn out, big, long, slow ten counts all the time, and then Cole did one with Lance, or not Cole, uh, Cowboy did one with Lance, and he did one with Cole, and then me and Hangman did one. So yeah, I feel like that's an AEW staple match now. That's yeah, pretty cool. Uh, 
and with those matches, like I kind of I love the feeling of like making people where they genuinely are shocked or don't know what's going on. Yeah, I don't like that. I mean, it, I, I get it. It stresses me out, though. And, you know, sometimes people go out there and they have a great match and the crowd loves it and they're there with the chants and they're there with the booing and the yaying and the cheering all at the right times. And the fans, they're going along for the ride, but they can almost like... They anticipate. They've rode this roller coaster two or yeah. three times. Yeah. You know, and there's a great time, but, you know, nothing was truly shocking. Yeah. In the Texas death match with Hangman, nobody had any idea <laughs> what was going to happen at any second. Like just kept taking it was it was more of like this car is completely out of control and off the road and it's just going all over the place like for example i brought a brick and smashed his hand with it yeah it was disgusting but i didn't like bring the brick out and then do a bunch of hoopla and this like there was no brick in the ring and just one second there's no brick in the ring i just rolled out grabbed the brick smashed his hand like really quickly and didn't give anybody any time to register like oh he's got a brick what's he gonna do like just all right what's going on next is that a brick oh my what the fuck like it, i wanted it to happen so fast that their brain couldn't even register it so they're like they what have the to pay hell? attention it makes people pay attention what's going too? on yeah, yeah so I, I couldn't have been, cool. uh, i couldn't have been any happier with that and i was thinking like uh you know the the finish i was like man i feel like it's really interesting. I feel like they're going to go nuts if I tap out. So I wanted to make sure that like submissions were legal and fans understood that. And I was mm -hmm. a little scared that they would be waiting on the 10 count and like wouldn't notice that I submitted. Right. But they were pretty clear about the rules. So I just had a feeling like I feel like they're going to go fucking nuts if I tap out. Mm -hmm. they, that's the last finish they would expect. You know? Yeah. It was great. Yeah. So like I couldn't have been any happier with that whole chef's deal. kiss Sup and super easy like mm. that's the good thing about like this year is uh i haven't been like overthinking anything or like not that i haven't been working hard because when i go out there i bust my fucking ass yeah but i, I just kind of let the match come to me more so than going out there trying to figure How, like, out like mr miyagi of you like I don't go out there and try and like plan out, okay, what would be, what would make an epic match? I just go out there and. <laughs> I don't know if their mic picked up. Is that a dog fart? I so hope that that was on there. <laughs> Sorry, that like, that um, blue just snapped a. <laughs> You're like, so we're stuck the in like the corner of the room with blue farting by us. That bastard. Um, uh, sorry, keep going. You were saying about how you don't plan, you don't plot out every little thing you're gonna yeah, do. Like you're kind of like, like feeling. I like it. a good story skeleton, and and for me, people that have worked with me enough know everything is subject to change. Right. We could plan out thirty spots, but once we get out there, I might go, no, never mind, and <laughs> you know, I mean, generally, I have a good. I do my I do my thinking away from the ring i'm thinking of, like i'm 24 7 always always i'm always i can tell when it switches I that i've lost you i love coming up with stuff i love talking about ideas shooting ideas back and forth to people i love you know like uh love training love, you know i i'm 24 7 thinking of shit and visualizing stuff and mm -hmm. kind of putting it in my head to use for later I do my thinking outside of the ring. And then when I get into the ring, I don't want to think at all. I just want to do. Like, yeah. You know? So yeah. I kind of re pre pre prepare my brain and all these things and, and get them in my head before. Yeah. So that when the, I'm in the ring, they just come out naturally. Be all fluid and loose. And yeah. So I, I don't want to think at all in the ring. Yeah. I just want to do. Yeah. Let it fly. Yeah, and, Let her uh, fucking rip, bro. Yeah, that's the way I like to do things. It's, it's, it's fun. It's so much fun. You know, wrestling's fun. It's funny because, like, I feel like a majority. I mean, I've had you obviously on here a bunch, um, and you don't really do a ton of like long interviews 
And I feel like you especially don't do a lot of interviews where you actually dissect your matches and talk about stuff like that. But I think this is probably pretty eye opening to a lot of people in terms of like how you how your mind works when it comes to wrestling. And obviously your passion for what you do is is pretty unmatched. Yeah, I generally don't like to do talk too much about like how the sausage is made. Yeah. Because it's not like protecting secrets so much as it is like once you know how the trick's done, it's not as yeah, it's not as fun to watch it. And right. It kind of feels like I'm kind of ruining the stuff a little bit. But also like, you know, fans love you know, appreciating and understanding the art of what we do, you know. So well, I think it's also just like appreciating the thought that you put into it because it's not something that just happens. You really do put so much thought and effort into what you do. And there's intention behind the things that you're doing and there's stories behind the things that you're doing. And I just I think that's probably pretty cool for people to to just understand the the level of dedication of, that you have to your craft. Yeah, and I definitely I don't And you're so don't, cute. That's true. Yeah, I definitely don't do like what yeah, I know. <laughs> Gonna, uh, shut her down uh, shut it on down but, uh, well i feel like we did it is there anything else you want to talk about we can we covered a lot of stuff we've been on here for a while you want to go watch a show uh yeah uh, I mean, if you listen to this you're probably aware of dynamite every wednesday um rampage fridays rampage fridays blood support on uh March 30th. Yeah. Uh, love those shows. So much yeah. fun. The most stress-free shows in the world. <laughs> just go out and just go out and wrestle, man. Yeah. You know, so it, it, it's uh, super fun to do those. So I'm a part of that. Man, I feel like I had something else to say. I can't think of what it was. They cut you off. Sorry. I don't remember. Hmm. What were we talking about? Jog your memory. We've been accused of sending the young bucks to the hospital. Mm. Okay, and I can see where you would uh and I could see how you could come to that conclusion. Yeah, but uh that we are innocent until proven guilty. Okay. So don't just jump to conclusions. Okay. That we attacked the young bucks and sent them to the hospital. Okay. The thing about the young bucks and the elite is that, you know, obviously there seems to be a lot of tension between us right now. But uh, I have a lot of respect for the young bucks or, you know, the elite guys. But the young bucks, for example, you know, they didn't follow anybody's that path they create they forged their own path and did things their way and uh you know a lot of people don't like the young bucks for one reason or another and don't like kenny or whatever and they find all kinds of problems with them and they don't uh because the way they do things isn't the set pattern or whatever that they think it is or whatever. There's a bunch bunch of people who just love to hate, you know, the young bucks because or whatever. They mostly because they hate themselves, I guess, you know. But like let's be very clear. A lot of these old timers and stuff that like to give the young bucks shit and call them spot monkeys and um uh, standing super kicks and this and that, whatever. They hate the young bucks because, you know, that's their own issue, you know. They uh their own insecurities or whatever. BCC, we are not that. That is not our problem with the Young Bucks or the Elite. We have a deep respect for what they have done in the ring. And on some level, even a kinship with the Elite for the way they have forged their own path and don't give a fuck what anybody else thinks. Because believe me, I give absolutely <laughs> zero fucks about anything right now. 
So just remember that, you know, if if any beef tends to if any beef, you know, over the coming weeks on dynamites or rampages does escalate between the BCC and the Young Bucks and Kenny. You know, we're not old guys with a podcast. Um, okay, listen, John, thank you for joining me. Um, I think you're as handsome as ever, as delicious as ever. Uh, I think that your legs are the unsung heroes of the wrestling world. I think you should come back out in trunks one time, just really rock everyone's world. You know what the problem with that is? Hmm. Uh, I wrestled in uh, tights in Japan. Oh, we saw. I started in New Japan. But I didn't have boots yet because I used to always mm. wrestle in trunks and boots. So I just wore my wrestling shoes, which I don't. I like wrestling. I like grappling and training in wrestling shoes, but I don't like running the ropes and stuff. And you know, especially coming out of the crowd, and I just feel like I'm like it's a lot of leg I feel out. Very dainty wrestling shoes in the. They are a dainty shoe, especially compared to the boots that you. And I hate wearing wrestling boots. I can't get comfortable in them anymore. I used to be used to it, but after so many years of just wearing the the combat boots like I do, yeah, I feel weird in anything but those. I and think it would be like you jarring. can't wear the combat boots that I wear with tights, no, or it looks weird. Yeah, it doesn't so go. That's the reason I don't wear tights. It's a footwear issue. I feel okay. most comfortable wrestling in Under Armour. Tactical boots and aloe yoga pants. Yes, and I would feel weird wearing tights. My my feet would look huge, and I would yeah. look like I would look like a court jester or something. It'd be weird, It'd be visually unpleasing. It would be weird. Yeah. I'm I'm just saying you've got a great leg. I I think that you I, your whole wrestling gear is is great. I'm not telling you to change it. I'm just putting over your legs because people don't really know. I'm just saying I'm looking at them and they're they're there's a sculpted leg. You have a very sculpted leg as well. I sure I don't do. Know people know that. Uh, you know what? You're right. Not enough people know of my sculpted. Pull leg. your hamstring out right now. Ready? Let me get my leg up there. You got these Look at hockey that. hamstrings. Oh my! I got to stretch. That hurts to do that kind of. Yeah, when you first came into WWE, you're talking about you know the new girl hamstrings. Ooh, 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 ooh. Um. Okay. Well, let's go touch each other's legs, and you want to go watch some Poker Face? We're all right, you know. No, you don't want to watch Poker Face. What do you want to watch? I don't know. All right, we'll go find something. I appreciate you coming on here. You're a lovely man. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye